In this video we'll take a look at the HP 23A AC power supply. This is a high voltage power supply designed to power some of Heathkit's HW and SB series of two based amateur radio equipment. I recently acquired a Heathkit HW101 transceiver and I'm in the process of restoring it. It didn't come with a power supply so I tracked down and acquired a suitable supply and recently finished restoring and testing it. Many of Heathkit's early amateur radio transceivers required a separate power supply. One of the reasons for a separate supply was so that they could offer both AC operated as well as mobile power supplies operating from a car battery so that the radios could be used as base stations or mobile units. This unit, the HP23A, is one of a series of very similar supplies that started with the HP23, which was introduced in 1963, to power some then current radios including the HW12, HW22, and HW32. It was replaced by the HP23A in 1968. As compared to its predecessor, the A model could be wired to run from either 120 or 240 volts AC. The pilot lamp on the HP23 was removed and the fuse was replaced by a circuit breaker. There were also some small circuit changes including adding a switch to select between two different low voltage output levels. In 1973 it was replaced by the HP23B which removed the adjustable bias supply and 6.3 volt filament output. It also switched to a three wire grounded power cord. In 1978 it was again superseded by the HP23C. This time the three position power switch was removed, requiring a wiring change to select the desired low voltage output. The last model in the series was the PS23C which was introduced in 1980 but was identical to the HP23C. It was offered until 1983. The reason for the model change is unclear but may have been to avoid confusion with products from Hewlett Packard like this HP35 calculator for example. By the 1980s, most of Heathkit's amateur radio equipment was solid state and did not require this type of power supply, making it obsolete. The HP23A provides the following outputs. A high voltage output of 700 volts DC at up to 250 milliamps. A lower high voltage output, switch selectable is either 250 or 300 volts DC at up to 100 milliamps a fixed bias voltage of minus 100 volts DC at 20 milliamps, an adjustable bias voltage of minus 40 to minus 80 volts DC at up to 1 milliamp, and both 6.3 and 12.6 volts AC filament voltages at up to 11 and 5.5 amps respectively. The outputs are filtered but unregulated. The radio itself would typically regulate the voltages as needed. Not all outputs were used by all radios. It can be wired for 120 or 240 volts AC input, 50 or 60 hertz, and takes 350 watts at maximum load. The unit weighs about 16 pounds. All outputs appear at the 11 pin socket with the signals marked on the case. Next to that is the circuit breaker reset button. This switch is used to turn the unit off or to select either 250 or 300 volt low voltage output. At the far left is the trimmer pot to adjust the variable bias output. There's no fan so the unit is silent. It has rubber feet and would typically sit on the floor of a radio shack. Alternatively the supply could be installed inside a speaker like this SB600. The design is quite simple with no tubes or transistors, just all passive components. It features a large power transformer with windings for the various outputs. On the primary side we have a power switch and circuit breaker. The high voltage circuit uses a voltage doubler with four silicon diodes and two large electrolytic caps. The low voltage output uses a voltage doubler with three diodes and a large 8 Henry choke for filtering. A switch selects different windings for 250 or 300 volt output. The fixed bias supply uses a single diode and two filter caps. The adjustable bias output uses a pot to set the voltage. Filament voltages come from a center tapped 12.6 volt winding and offers both 6.3 and 12.6 volt outputs. All connections go to the 11 pin tube socket type connector that typically connects to the radio using a cable. 
AC power also passes through two pins of the connector so that the supply can be turned and off remotely at the radio. A word about safety. While any AC operated equipment can be dangerous to work on, this unit produces almost a thousand volts DC which can easily produce a lethal shock. You need to exercise extreme caution when working on or testing it. Make sure that any meter used to measure the high voltage output is rated for the voltages this high. This reasonably good x -Tech meter is rated up to a thousand volts but lower cost meters may not be. Because there's no pilot lamp, double check that it's really turned off and unplugged with working on it. Even when powered down it takes about one minute for the filter caps to discharge with no load and much longer if the bleeder resistors were to become open. Note that because it uses a voltage doubler circuit, the cases of two of the large electrolytic filter caps are not grounded. The cardboard covers on the caps are also not to be trusted as good insulators. Removing the cover you can see the power transformer, choke, and larger filter capacitors mounted on the chassis. The rest of the components and point-to-point -point wiring can be found under the chassis. One final safety note, some units have been found where the power connector was wired incorrectly using the male connector for the cable rather than the female one. This would expose voltages directly on the pins. Note that when testing the supply without a radio in order to power it up, you need to short together the AC switch and AC common pins. I acquired this unit on eBay in February 2016. It came with a cable but no manual. It was in good condition with the cover a little bent. I suspect the cover may have been repainted. I found a complete manual and schematic on the internet. After some initial inspection I powered it up carefully with a Variac and all outputs seemed to be working well. It appeared to have all original parts. The workmanship was okay but not great. All resistors and diodes were good. The electrolytic capacitors, while they seemed okay, were likely over 40 years old and should be replaced, particularly as I plan to use this regularly with an HW101 transceiver. Kits are sold by a number of suppliers of parts like replacement caps, cables, and even a complete printed circuit board to replace the internal wiring. I opted to replace all the filter caps consisting of the four large ones mounted on the chassis and three smaller ones underneath. I opted to restuff the larger cap so that the unit still looked original. I removed the cardboard tubes and cut off the old aluminum cans near the end, removing the innards. I then drilled two holes and wired up the new smaller caps. Placing the cardboard tubes back over the top, it still looks original. The three smaller caps under the chassis were replaced and are similar in size to the originals. I also replaced the line cord with a modern heavy-duty three-wire cord connecting the ground wire to the chassis. The HP23A was one of a series of power supplies that were sold almost unchanged for 20 years. Many of them were manufactured and they show up regularly at sources like flea markets and eBay. All were sold only as kits. The radios that this supply would work with were the HX1 and HR1, HW12, 22, and 32, SB100, 102, 110, and 110A, and HW100 and 101. The HP23A model is arguably the best unit as it has some outputs and a switch that were removed in later versions. If you have the original HP23 model, you might want to make the component value changes that were made in the 23A and later. Now that the power supply is working, I'm now ready to work on my HW101. Watch for that in a future YouTube video.